you so much for coming. It's a pleasure and so excited for you to be here. So this week we have the one and only Steve Brow. He is the CEO, founder of Royal Ambulance. Now I'm going to let Steve do an intro on himself just because he's been um, in the scene of building his company for I believe, the last 12 years. And I mean, there's a lot of work doing that here in the Bay Area and he's done an incredible job. And I can't make you know, the intro for him and really cover all the pieces, so I'll let him talk about you know, who he is and how he got here. So if you want to give a quick intro, that'd be awesome. Sure, well, again, uh, thank you guys for coming. Uh, Josh is a mutual friend, that was my brother-in-law, uh, who we just brought on to market and try to grow our business because we've been very geographically based. We're based here in the Bay Area and we started out in San Leandro for those who don't know, it's uh, right across the bay in, uh, uh, next to Oakland. and. Uh, uh, we cover pretty much all Bay Area, but the way that the medical transportation business works, especially the ambulance stuff, we are regulated by like 47 different agencies. One of them is uh, emergency medical services agencies, and in order for you to grow, you got to apply and get a license. So like the growing thing is a very uh, structured and limited thing, so, but it, it all the principles of growth apply to marketing and in order for us to scale beyond this immediate geography we also need to figure out how to innovate and get a little bit you know smarter uh, with today day and age and technology and growth marketing and so I'm learning as a CEO alongside I think all of us on how to hack our growth but also how to deliver better results quicker and faster because you know when you think about like a 12 year old startup that doesn't make lots of sense from the technical uh, digital world but if you look at the business projections or how the businesses are structured especially in such a heavy labor involved business such a regulated business um, I think we're just kind of tapping into the, our potential and opportunity and dialing in what we're um, trying to do best, which is innovate in the healthcare space and adopt with a lot of um, elements that are constantly challenging our healthcare environment. For those of you who are following healthcare, there's a lot of changes, a lot of consolidation. We'll dive in and talk a little bit about that. Um, more, but I started. Um, funny story, I actually started in the Bay Area when I was 12 years old. We moved here. I was uh, I was born and raised in uh, Odessa, Ukraine. And uh, funny story about this building. My first job um, as I immigrated with my family was working for the San Francisco Chronicle and Examiner. And one of the first uh, outside of the paper routes, one of the first hustles I had was selling newspapers at Candlestick Park. So the way that it would work out is, you know, you'd come here right into this building, in fact, into the little back alley over there, and uh, you would meet with your crew. And your crew would basically load up Sunday papers, and for those of you who have seen the back in the day Sunday paper, this motherfucker was like five pounds. So you, you know, you basically took your Sunday papers, you loaded up in this little, a metal cart and you loaded the carts back on the on the truck and then you drove to Candlestick Park right around 9 a.m. when people started tailgating. So as they're tailgating, you're running behind uh, around the rows and you're trying to sling them the newspaper, right? They're getting fucked up and you're like, oh, here, grab them for Sunday paper, Sunday paper. So that was my kind of first hustle. But the real hustle was because half of the people don't uh, use all their tickets. And so they will give you a ticket for a paper, like my friend didn't come, here's a ticket. And then you really make money on selling tickets. So after you're done with the newspapers, you stand in front next to the booth that tries to sell the tickets and now hustle the booth. So that was my kind of first hustle, hustle here with the, with the Chronicle Examiner. So this really brings me like lots of memories. Um, I grew up here, I'm not a biggest studious person, I didn't go to college, uh, just didn't agree with uh, philosophy, no, I just have all kinds of learning disabilities, so I'm a much more um, hands-on person. I did tech for the next uh, 10 years, I used to be in an IT um, 
director, consultant, and I worked for all kinds of different companies from startups because it was back in the late, late 90s, early 2000s, so dot-com was booming. This is where you just register shit with dot-com and, you know, sold it tomorrow for a ridiculous amount of money if you got an amazing domain name. I don't know, for those who remember, people used to be in a domain name game hustle. I mean, they didn't do shit else. They just bought domain names and then sold them later, which is crazy, right? But um, that's what I did for the next 10 years. And then after going through some personal reflections and life's funny, I think sometimes in that way, it's like, right, your mind is like a big Google search engine. If you put down a interesting search string, it'll start returning results. Uh, for me, it was looking for new opportunities. And then what really led me to this is my grandfather uh, had two strokes, which kind of left him paralyzed. And then I ended up being his care coordinator and that's what got me into healthcare. You know, fast forward 12 years, um, I started this medical transportation business and then we've been grinding ever since. So that's kind of the, the basic story. Over that course, we've been you know, fortunate to um, I think make a ton of mistakes. So I'm open to discussing some of those. Uh, we earned some accolades. We got on the Inc. Uh, five thousand fastest growing companies a bunch of years in a row and now we're trying to really focus on um, a couple of things you know geographic growth and scalability as challenging as it is in the regulated environment uh, we're looking really all you know those elements of product market fit how can we identify and serve and, and currently structure our offering um, to better fit within the healthcare challenges and then we're always trying to figure out how to keep our employment pipeline full because this is everybody's challenge today in healthcare. People can't, because the market is so hot, people can't find entry level positions and can't staff them. So if I can't stuff, uh, staff ambulances, I can't run calls. So those are kind of just like the general elements which we're focusing on. So I'll uh, pause at that. Wow, I mean, it's definitely been an incredible journey for you. And, you know, as you got into this industry, um, obviously it's, well, I think one of the things that's funny is, you know, I like to say a lot of people try to avoid emergencies with new businesses, and you sort of made emergencies your business, taking care of them, right? Well said. And now you're starting this company, and do you have anybody who was either like a mentor or you looked up to in the industry who could give you some direction at least, or were you just doing this entirely on your own? You know, in, in terms of uh, mentors, I, I didn't have anybody in, um, in this industry. I, in general, this medical transportation space is super stale and uh, there's just not a lot of innovation that goes on around it. I mean, so really, when you're looking for opportunities to disrupt stuff, you know, things like that are like prime for picking. Um, in terms, you know, back to mentors, I, I really didn't really have a lot of mentors growing up, period. As I mentioned, um, I was kind of doing stuff on my own. I think a lot of my inspiration uh, came from reading like Fortune magazine and you're like, read fortune and stories about people that do shit. And, you know, again, kind of, um, internet was just coming around not to age myself, but you know, you, you didn't have as much content as you have right now. Right. Right now, content is coming out of everywhere. But before like fortune, you read the magazine, you read people's stories and really the people's achievement. And you're like, they did this. I can do this. So I think it's just changing your mentality and your perspective. And, and another thing, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you another side story. Um, what, what inspired me is actually meeting uh, my wife's fr um, father's friends uh, and my wife's father, who was also an entrepreneur. And he started a company and grew it. And then you met his friends and they're all like immigrants, right? And the immigrants barely speaking English, but they're hustling, hustling their own, they're, they're doing their own shit. Uh, some in finance, some in translation. And then once you have that little circle 
of people that have been there and done that. And once you break through, you know, not just like, oh, magazine pages, that shit is in, you know, a little remote, but once you have that in the forefront, I think that was my real biggest, like, oh, I'm not that much stupider than these people. Um, and so, like, I, I think that element of creating a circle of reality around you and making that circle real is what really gave me inspiration. Not just, you know, business related and healthcare. I think as you're progressing in, in different ways, you will find like, oh, look at what they're doing, look at what they're doing. But bringing that into your sphere is what I think really pushes you into reality. Yeah, and, and you know, going off of that point, that many people just, the problem is they stay as spectators and they just never get into the support. Right. You know, and you were a spectator and then got into the sport, and that's really what made the difference. And, you know, going off of that, you know, one of the hardest things to do in founding any company is knowing who your co-founders are going to be. And your reason for starting this company was probably very different than theirs. Um, you had, you know, a personal, I would say, you know, a tragedy is the right word that really motivated you for it. Um, how do you get your co-founders on board and get them to be just inspired as you are to go and push the company forward, especially in the early days? Uh, super good question, right? Um, because we all need support. I, I, I think co-founders, it, it, it's a stretchy kind of a sense. So when I started the company, the first two dudes that I got to help me out were my childhood best friends. And it's about uh, finding um, and understanding what you're missing from you know understanding the big picture to me was finance i mean up until like now uh more or less i was completely financially retarded which made me make so many mistakes around that uh, particular field so you know the first person i got like can you help me was my best friend from childhood because he had an mba from uh, in finance and um he was helping me part time. He had a full time job actually at Ring Central that went public a little uh, recently, and he cashed out nicely. Uh, but it was a, a part time job for him, and and, and that, that this is one advice I'm gonna you know be very um, I, I think specific about. You really gotta consistently benchmark the people that work with you. And just because they helped you start something doesn't mean that they need to continue with you. I literally bought him out this year, which was probably five years too late, <laughs> right? It, it, legitimately, because um, I was, as your organization grows, your needs change. And um, my second partner was uh, also my childhood, my high school best friend. And this guy had a gift of gab, was super good guy, um, and he could be like the face of the company because part of our business development was all about hustle, let us engage with customers and make sure we're on top of the mind and because it's such a, you know, analog business in a way. Um, so he was excellent at that. But I think as you grow, your needs consistently change and you gotta be constantly real about what that change requires because if you're stuck with the same people your growth is going to be greatly impacted and i think we could have been way further ahead if i was real about those challenges but you just don't know how to confront that so figuring out at which point you need to disconnect and at which point you need to learn how to recruit how to hire how to manage how to lead all of those elements become but Again, I don't say I don't think build, finding your close friends and bringing them on early on if they have applicable skills is a bad idea. You might fuck up your spray friendship later on. That's totally true. I did with with, with so, you know, that's just how it goes. But um, because that's also things you learn. I had a really nice separation this time around. The first time around, it was not so nice. And, um, but, but again, I think when you're starting out, you've got to have people that have your back because you can't really worry about relational coordination. I just met you. I don't know what you're about, right? We're just learning how to speak our language. When, when it's your boys, you already know what it's all about. 
you know they're gonna stay up and they're, you know they're gonna have your back if that's the most important thing back then. So that's kind of my thing about founders. Yeah, it makes complete sense. You know, one of the things is like, how are you gonna work 20 hour days and if you just met somebody like four months ago and trust them to do that with you? It's, it's very difficult to say the least. Now, you're entering into this space and you could have done, you know, a number of things in the healthcare space to say the least but you chose transportation. Now, is it because there was a large demand that there was, you know, great, as you would say, maybe like product market or product service market fit around this that you jumped in? And was that the reason for it? Um, it was a couple of reasons for it. So, you know, in Silicon Valley, we talk a lot about prototyping, right? We talk a lot about build your MVP, right? We talk a lot about innovation from the technology perspective and the, from just the development of things. To me, it started out as prototyping a career because um, I looked at healthcare and I said, look, A, I can be passionate about it. There is like a tremendous amount of impact that you can make from a very interpersonal space because if you're helping people and you're making thing world a better place, you know, whether it's my personal side or you have a cascading impact, you know, it, it has a different emotionally thing gratification. So it's like, okay, um, healthcare is awesome, but I am not the best or astute a learner. Um, I'm not going to medical school, that's for sure. Um, so how else can I apply what I know how to do in IT, which is really solve problems, right? Like IT, being IT and being an EMT it is, um, really similar because you're approaching things from an algorithmic problem-solving level. You know, what's the mechanism of injury? What hurts? What's broken? How can I fix it based on what I know how to fix? So the way that I looked at it is what's the quickest way I can get into healthcare? And to become an EMT, it takes 160 hours of uh, training. You can basically go to an accelerated uh, school and do it in a two week, 14 day boot camp. After 14 days, you've got to go and pass your national registry exam back, uh, you know, when grandpa did it, there was no registry exam. So you just apply with a county and get your card and boom, you can go and touch people. You know, so it, it's a, it, it was the quickest way for me to say, yes, I like doing that. No, I should move on. So I think that element of prototyping uh, was alive and well from that perspective. Maybe I didn't verbalize it that way, but it, it was also a great way for me just it, it, with back to the ambulance space in particular, it was also if you evaluated where you can start and what you need in order to get started, it was also a very low barrier to entry. You, um, it, it was somewhat loosely regulated just because I started in San Leandro. There wasn't uh, a lot of licensure that I had to get back then. Today, everybody smarted up and there's licensure gal galore. But um, I think uh, those two elements, how quickly can I start? What's the lowest amount of money I can spend to figure out if I'm gonna be success or failure, if I'm gonna like it or hate it? You know, it, all of that applied to my decision to do that, and I think it paid off fairly well. That's great to hear. And obviously, you know, you guys are growing, so I uh, definitely agree with you. You guys are on a great trajectory. Now, one of the things is, you know, so you, you got started and you understand what field you want to be in, and now you're finally starting to deliver as a, like, say, like customer service, right? You're working with customers, but also patients. And it's not just one side, there's two sides of this equation and you're in this constant balance. And you have to define your service on the feedback you're giving you. So how has your service changed based on the patient feedback as well as the customer feedback that you're getting? Oh wow, it's, it's, um, this is a really challenging subject matter for us. And I'll tell you why. Because when we originally started the company, and you, again, your thoughts are just not well formed, right? You think you're like, oh, you know, it, I've seen how, what kind of care my grandfather gets rendered. So I see opportunity. I see how patients react to amazing clinicians. 
I see how they wither with the, you know, when people don't treat them like people. When people get reminded that they're a dependent, that is a big mindfuck and people get really depressed, or, or, you know, around that. Once you're depressed, really hard to, for you to react to clinical care. And, and, and that's just a physiological fact. So, you know, when we're starting working on the patient scenario and how can we make the patient's journey better, um, it, it was really interesting and really awesome. But then as we were progressing, you realize that I'm not in a really, oh gosh, I want to say it uh, nicely. Let, let me say the other statement. And I'm really a business to business. Patients are not my customers directly. Uh, it's not insurance companies, but they are one of those. Uh, who hires us directly is healthcare institutions, number one. Um, so we started out with skilled nursing facilities. So skilled nursing, oh, you know what, let me rewind this for one second, just so, because you think ambulance service lights and sirens, right? And, and we're in ambulance service lights and sirens. So in order to be a 911 ambulance service with lights and sirens, you have to get a contract with a county, right? In order for you to get a contract with a county, you gotta grow your way into it. Because no county wants to say, oh, hey, you just started a company? Cool, take care of my 700,000 people. Good luck, right? Nobody's gonna do that. You gotta come in and say like, oh, I've done this, I've done this, and this is my capability and the capacity. Plus, you need to know how to grease all the political wheels. Plus, you gotta know how to show uh, performance standards. On the 911 side, it gets crazy complicated. This is why there's like three companies in the United States that bid for contracts like Alameda County, Santa Clara. San Francisco is a fucking disaster um, because there's like zones and fire department and then it gets super political. It's crazy. The point of the story is we serve hospital systems because what they worry about is population health because they got a ton of patients coming into their emergency departments and they have to discharge a ton of patients to different other healthcare entities. Now, the other customer segment, and that's really where we started, is skilled nursing facilities because they have thousands of really sick old people and those really sick old people get really sick and old all the time and they really need uh, transport to help them either go to the hospital, oh my God, it's not a life-threatening emergency, but it's an emergency. So we started building a system that was kind of replicated 911. So meaning that if a grandma in a skilled nursing facility gets really sick, they call us and we're there in 20 minutes. It's not nine minutes and 59 seconds like 911, but for most, most emergencies that does the job just fine. And so that, you know, took us into like, wait, those are our customers. HBR has an amazing article. It's like, it, it really says, who's your primary customer? Because everybody can't be your primary customer. You wanna know where to focus your resources, right? Like if you say, okay, the supply chain is my primary customer, or the patients are my primary customer, or employees are my primary customer, because all those three can be really true. It's kind of why we started focusing our mission and really looking at all three of those segments. Because if I don't keep the patients happy and deliver the highest level of patient experience, then nobody wants to hire me because that's my differentiator because I make them look good. I make my customers look good in front of their patients. But if I can't deliver on the quick response times, ease of use and things like that, then I'm fucked, nobody wants to hire me. But if I can't treat my employees in the best of a possible manner, we establish this partnership, then nobody come, wants to come to work for me. So keeping your stakeholders balanced, but also differentiating who's your primary customer is very important exercise you play along somewhere. So I hope I answered that. It seems like you know you're obviously in a very difficult market to you know to find that customer and obviously you know get that customer to come on board. Can you talk to us a little bit about you know what your sales cycle looks like in something like this and maybe that's a barrier to entry alone of why most people, people don't start a business in this industry? Yeah, absolutely. So when we started, our original customer segment was still nursing facility. Again, because of the reason of low barrier to entry. 
because I, the way that it works, in any, in, in any skilled nursing facility, I have about 30 nurses who can pick up the phone and call me directly. So those become my immediate customers. I'm not worried about contracts because my contract is my word that I'm gonna be there consistently in 30 minutes or less or your pizza is free. So I'm gonna you know, really try to make sure that my KPIs, what I'm measuring in terms of performance is consistent. And so that's an easy way for, was an easy way for us to build up customer base and to build up scale. And now if I'm in the territory and I got seven ambulances constantly bringing patients to a hospital, now they're interested. Now, the biggest opportunity is obviously hospitals because they, they have um, such mass. I, I, if I close, uh, for, for example, um, Sutter Health, who is a 30 hospital a healthcare system, is probably uh, $45 million in the annual revenue for me. I don't have them, um, <laughs> but but because I don't have them because I don't have scale geographically, right? But um, smaller healthcare systems, like one of, one of my biggest customers is Alameda Health System, and uh, they have like three hospitals, three skilled nursing facility, a psych. They really uh, cater to the sickest of the sick and the neediest of the needy in Alameda County. And the, the sales cycles there can be crazy because part of it is establishing context. Part, part, part of it is making sure that they have a need. Part of it is making them fire their existing provider. So all of that takes a lot of time and energy. My sales cycle can be a year or if I get an RFP, which is the worst fucking process ever, um, then it's going to be a lot shorter, like six to seven months. Wow. Um, yeah, definitely, I would say, a tough barrier to entry to get into and deal with those type of sales cycles as well as, you know, the number of variables. It's not just showing up to conferences and having a weekly, you know, or bi-monthly bi monthly meeting with somebody or just follow up emails. Uh, so, one of the things I know about you is you're definitely focused on improving your management skills and you've been doing that since almost, you know, year one. And can you tell us some of the biggest things you've learned in uh, dealing with obstacles within your company, um, whether it be feedback or anything else, and those biggest learning experiences that you've had as a manager, founder, CEO? Sure. Um, gosh, I mean, there are so many. Um, I probably on a consistent basis learning new things every day. I, I mean, I think because you're, when you're starting out, right, you're so focused on growth. Like, how do I grow? How do I get customers? How do I grow? How do I get customers? Right. And then you're like, how do I make my service better? And then, it, so there's all this that, as I mentioned, it's important to define that one of your most important stakeholders are your employees and building out good employee systems. And you guys, you see that every day, right? Like you see that every day in, in the companies that scale too fast, <laughs> or, uh, <laughs> that, you know, are focused so much on growth, they forget about the importance of organizational culture. So I, I think developing those um, feedback systems, the close connections, I mean, if you, you can really, there's consultants and books and whatever have you, uh, in terms of dialing in these elements of constantly measuring the temperature, because I'll tell you what, the war, and I work with these different hospital systems, the worst healthcare providers are the ones that burned out and they're just burned out and they're just sitting there fucking angry and they're still rendering healthcare. It's like, you know, like healthcare without empathy is like Disneyland without fun. <laughs> right? It, 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 it's legitimately like an oxymoron. So I, I think people that, you know, are burned out on healthcare, and it's easy to burn out on healthcare, need to figure out how to move on, move on. And your job as a leader to figure out whose time is it to move on, how to re-engage them, how to, you know, put them in a different place. So I think there's a lot of that. The other biggest, 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 um, I, I think lesson I had was about risk. So when you're entering into 
uh, and, it's, and that's another oxymoron for when you're like a startup founder, right? Because you're like, your whole existence is about risk. Like, how am I going to make payments? How am I going to pay my salaries? What am I going to do? You know, like, there's all this risk that's constantly evolved around you. And if you're risk averse, you're not going to start some shit, right? So if you're going to get into an industry like this, you're naturally going to have some numbness to some elements of risk. But that really screwed me along the way because when you're not acute to different elements of risk, like uh, employment law and all other kinds of elements, uh, like I said, Medicare, Medi-Cal, everybody got a ton of rules. How do they do their job? How do you play by their rules? It's really that, like how do you play by their rules? And there's so many rules that you got to keep on top of because Fucking up one of them can really hurt you. Really, 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 I mean, kill you. So I think, like, learning what risk is all about was one of those moments for me. You know, I think we, we had a serious issue, which we luckily recovered from, but many companies don't. So, like, figuring out what's your risk, like, what can screw you and kill you overnight? Right? What can seriously stop your pro progress? And figuring those elements out, just like figuring your happy employee stuff, that's really important. The other stuff, I think you're gonna product market fit, marketing, sales, you'll get that stuff eventually. And if you don't, that's okay. You'll just grow slower. It's not all about growth. It's also about sustainable growth. And if you don't have sustainable um, elements supporting that growth, you're not gonna grow longer term so taking on that note you know you guys are having sustainable growth at this point what does the future look like for you in terms of planning for growth executing on growth and you know, expanding to new territories as well um it's a, it's a great question i'm like literally trying to be answered um all the time <laughs> and that's kind of part of what i'm thinking okay right it, part of it is value what, what value do you bring to your customers you constantly got to be like what value do i bring to them but it's also figuring it out what do they need when do they need it how do you deliver it how do you make it better where do you fit in the market space then you of course start also thinking about like profitability how do i do it profitably how do we scale profitably i'll, I'll give you an example like we've tried a service where we would visit patients post discharge so one of the big, I don't know how much people know about healthcare, um, but one of the big issues in healthcare right now is patients being readmitted to the hospital because it's a huge cost and you know, you didn't treat the patient completely and they get back sick, they're boom, they're back in the hospital and they get the whole workup again. And so the, 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 like half of healthcare talks about like, how can we be, uh, keep patients at home more often? So we're like, wait a minute, we're outside the walls of the hospital. Maybe we can do this. And so we've launched this whole testing your products and trying shit out. And we, we launched a whole service where we would visit patients at home. But it was so low, such low margins and so difficult to scale that we agreed that that's probably not going to be the best long-term strategy. For us, long-term strategies right now is, a, is a, figuring out how to scale geographically. Scaling geographically um, very organically is super hard because, again, I go to Sacramento. I got to build new network. I got to build new relationships. I got to buy all this. I got to hire people. Super hard. It takes forever, forever. So now I'm thinking, well, how do I accelerate that? One way of acceleration is partnerships, joint ventures. So I'm, I'm all about like figuring out how can I find the leaders in that market and how can I help apply my operational knowledge and leverage and scale what we've learned here. I don't need the whole pie. I can share my pie with you, but if you can be the right partner for me. So that's my scalability strategy right now. So hope that answers the question. Yeah, I mean, it's, it sounds like, you know, you're going into a new territory, you know, whatever that city may be, whatever that county may be, and it's not just like, hey, we're going to go and spend some money on Facebook ads, going to a landing page, and that's where we're going to, you know, land new customers, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, or, you know, we're just going to do, uh, build a little community, but it's like, hey, we got to establish partnerships, go through policies, we got to go through regulations, uh, we 
we got to talk to maybe like five, ten different decision makers, and then get not only just get them on board with their mission, but build that friendship and knowing that that's going to be there for a very long time. Uh, and then, like as you said, um, maybe even firing um, the existing person that they're working with, um, so they can work with you. Um, and maybe the existing person that they're working with, you know, referencing what you said, is just burnt out. It just doesn't want to be there anymore. Right. Um, you know, who put it best for me is uh, Marissa uh, Mayer, who used to be the CEO of Yahoo, and you know, I think she broke out, broke down burnout as an inability to do shit you like. I, I mean, really sacrificing things that are important, you know? So figuring out like what's important to you, like to me, I like to party, I like my family, I like having a social life, um, you know, I like physical activity. So I think figuring out how to build your schedule, to build those things in, so that you're not depriving yourself, because let's be real, if you're gonna go down this journey, you're gonna put a shit ton of time in, right? Like, to me, I like to work in just big spurts. Like, I'll work like, I don't know, three weeks in a row, I'll skip some weekends, do that, right? But then I'll take a month off, right? Like, this, this, this summer, and this is like when you're way late in the process, like, you know, you hustle for 12 years. <laughs> you know, I took two months off with my kids. So we traveled around the world and that was amazing because to me, that was one of those things that I really wanted to do. And you got to be able to move your goals. I was hoping I'll get to do this way earlier, but you know, here we are. Um, you know, it's all about those setbacks. And I think, you know, I'll tell you one more thing. I think it's a lot about not being so hard on yourself and learning how to talk to yourself, right? You gotta learn how to talk to yourself because a lot of us, when we get on this journey and you, you deal with all the shit that you just brought up, oh, look at this guy, look at my competitor, look at where they are, I'm 12 years into this, they're a billion dollar company, I'm making 20 million, like what the fuck, right? So you, you deal a lot with that. And, and so, and, and that helps, and then you just establish the low voice. Like, oh, you're an idiot, you're a failing, blah, blah, blah. And you know, I think we all start out with that, but learning how to make a voice be quiet or make it be positive, identifying trends that are not helping you build yourself, right? And letting them go is really, 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 really important. I think for me, like the breakthrough thing, was working with a coach because when I was um, having a lot of failures, it was really depressing, right? And you, you can get veered off on all kinds of tangents there, but you know, if you're like not a success in your own eyes or you fucked something up really important, you know, you get on that, on, into that cycle. And so again, like I had to like hire a coach and the coach for me is like, hey, here's my behavior, I don't want to have this behavior anymore, I don't want to hear that voice anymore, what do I need to do about it? So having a third party, whatever it is, right, like a little circle that helps you out, or hiring a professional, even better, um, my coach lives in Oregon, I, I see him, you know, once a year, but we talk, and we're talking every week, once a week, one phone call, one hour, here's what's going on, negative self-talk, let's get rid of it. So I think things like that, help you be cool about where you are. I don't want to get all zen, but that's just key. Because if you're happy where you are and you're not worried about competition or you, you still want to be driven, I still want to be succeeding, I still want to kick ass, right? But I'm just cool if, you know, where I'm at, I am where I'm at. It just was meant to be in my own development, with my own understanding, with my own skills. You know, that's just it. Oh, that like. Cool. Wow, I just want to thank you so much for being here tonight and taking time out of your busy schedule and let's just give Steve a round of applause.